of two great local talent. Um, one is Brian Kalana, I'm sure most of you know you him, yeah. and Marcus Young. So they're going to be sharing their love for, I guess, for sports and that kind of thing, like surfing, and then how it sort of led to your stuntsman and working in Hollywood, and how there's, you know, connections in what you love to do and then what you can do, um, you know, as a career-wise. And then hopefully, you know, if you want to uh, let us know, we can load some stuff on the computer and then we can show. If you want to try out some, you know, some action moves, we've cleared the way for you. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, you can tell them to do it. But yeah, here, you can come see me so you don't need to stand or if you want to. Um, we can do it that way. And then Gary, sort of, did you want to facilitate or we'll just let you guys sort of... I'm going to let them go and I'll ask some questions. If, uh, yeah, okay. if so if I you want to sort of just sharing a little bit about the, your background, you know, kind so of... Get a little bit of my background. Born, born and raised here, west side of Oahu, in Car Beach specifically. Um, my father being one of the pioneer surfers, Buffalo, Carolina. We just had this contest this past weekend where it's kind of the, like the Olympics of all the water people from around the world show up and stuff too. But um, I went to Wanya High School and... Um, you know, as a kid growing up, you really don't know what you're doing or what you're gonna do in the future. You just kind of like play and exist. And I wanted to be like a professional surfer. I accomplished all my goals. And I think what was um, neat back then is I had a teacher that sat me down and asked me, you know, to write down goals. And he kind of gave me one plate of like writing things down and, and achieving certain attainable goals. And that's kind of where I kicked off and started off and just being, you know, my life is successful because my strengths was knowing my weaknesses and whatever I was weak at, that's what I would strengthen. So I would love challenges as they come along. So being in a, in a surfing world, productions would come in and they go like, they're like the top surfers, uh, top this and that. And I got involved in filmmaking that way at the age of 17, where I did a national commercial and found out how good the money was, you know, just in commercials and stuff and being um, in front of the camera, you know, kind of thing. But as time went on, you know, I became a lifeguard and did safety work. I started investing more time into productions and trying to understand how it all works because it doesn't take one person to be successful. It takes a whole team of people. And understanding the people from the the foundation of like the PAs, pr the production assistants, of how hard they work for little money and how much uh, non-sleep they have, you know, they hardly sleep, they just work and work and working, you know, to every person that um, light direction and camera direction and, you know, greens and, you know, there's so much different facets of what's being filmed um, in the, you know, what we understand behind this frame because that's what they're showing you is just here and you don't see outside of this. And it's the magic of creating of all that. But the biggest thing what I took away was really the art of storytelling and being a, a passionate filmmaker in telling stories. And we've all told, told stories. We've all heard stories from our grandmas and our grandpas and our aunties and uncles. And we got some big storytellers here in Hawaii, you know? And some of them, they even, you know, they, get into the fantasy world, you know? And, and that's what's great about Hawaii and stuff also too. And I travel around the world and meet up with probably the best, I work in the, in the stunt industry, you know, where we do all the action and stuff too. Um, my biggest thing where it kicked off was Waterworld. So I was in Waterworld for like eight months and met all the top guys. And then we kind of like exchanged knowledge. I never went to film school, but being on set, you learn from the best and when you learn stuff you learn from the directors you learn from the stunt coordinators you learn from the editors and um, you just gather all this knowledge so for me it's, it's still going to school and always learning and stuff also too so that's kind of how I've been brought up into um, God you know I, I do film full-time we just finished um, both me and Marcus uh, 5 last just last week 
and we kind of on set. We both actually took off just to be here with you guys because we feel that you guys are futures of what filmmaking is and stuff also too. But rather than talk about myself mostly too, um, we can go back and forth, Marcus. Oh, I knew I had to follow in the footsteps. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Marcus Young. Um, born here, somewhat raised here, but then moved to the mainland. Um, and I always realized that I wanted to work in film, but didn't know how. And my background is martial arts. Um, you know, being Asian, you get typecasted. Oh, he's a martial artist. So um, I just took that and I harnessed that and was the best that I could. So I competed in the tournament circuit, had sponsorship, you know, went all the way up and fulfilled my dreams as far as in the martial art world. But I, I felt like there's more. So um, I ended up doing a workshop actually uh, that taught stunt fighting seminar. It was a stunt fighting seminar. And the guy hired out of the seminar and he liked what I did because it was like, uh, you know, the attitude from, from Hawaii, go for broke. So I, they, they made us put a fight together, and I go, told the guy, just grab me, and then just chuck me over your shoulders. And the guy goes, you sure? And I go, yeah, just do it. And, you know, that was when, you know, I was younger, and now I would advise you guys not to do that. I said, <laughs> put a bat in there. <laughs> but, um, but that, you know, that was kind of my upbringing, and that next week he said are you available to work and I said absolutely and I ended up showing up in Simi Valley at a dirt lot and put this fight together with this kid um, on a low-budget film and so I like to say I came up the low-budget no-budget realm to you know some of the, the top action films that you guys probably have seen um, so martial arts was my 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 leg into the stunt community uh, stunt world um, and along the way, you train with different people um, and gain knowledge, like Brian says. Everyone shares knowledge. Um, the people that are probably the m most successful are the ones that want to share their knowledge. The ones that are probably not so successful, that want to keep everything to themselves, are usually the ones that don't share the knowledge. So, um, you know, as much as you guys are privileged to have Brian here, you know, just to sit up here with him and, and talk to you guys is inspirational to me. Um, I went through film school though, so I actually was going to Northridge on a kinesiology scholar, uh, uh, major, and I said, do I really want to do that? The only reason why I was doing it at the time was because I was teaching karate. So I thought, well, this would be a good blend of the two, and then I got there and realized that they have a radio television film program so I w knew that I wanted to do um, stunts I was kind of doing it here and there it was like I said I was doing the low budget no budget realm and uh, I, actually he just heard the story um, a friend of mine was was just here um, I was making sushi part-time uh, and teaching karate and going to school so I had paid my way through college so I you know Hustle during the day, switch, wash my hands, make sure they smell like fish, go teach karate, and then whatever I could afford, I would put towards my education. So, some of you guys, you know, are probably in the same boat. Um, other guys, maybe mom or dad is helping you guys out, so make sure you thank them, because it is tough to try to put yourself through school. Um, but it's also very rewarding because nobody can take that away from you. Once you have your degree and your education, nobody can say you didn't go through the proper channels you know, to be where you are. So really like, cherish these moments and take them in because a lot of people don't have the opportunity that you guys have, so, so embrace that. You know, and, and you guys are all here for a reason, right? Probably because you're passionate. So don't lose that passion throughout college don't lose that passion throughout when you get into the business when you make it in the business always stay passionate because that's the thing that's going to drive you to continue to be better so yeah we, me and Mark is just talking about um, we have friends and um, we always hustling over work but the difference between us and some of our, our friends is they treat work as a job 
was we treat this as a lifestyle. We treat this with passion. We want to do incredible film, <coughs> you know, but we want to do it with the right people. You know, like um, I, I've done so much different films and worked with some of the greatest, you know, directors and producers. And uh, one of them I did with Brian Gray's of Blue Crush. And um, Brian met up with me and um, Don King. He's a phenomenal cinematographer that really knows uh, inside and out about surf and ocean. And everybody gets afraid of filming in the water. What's easy for us is not for them, you know, and we simplify things. So the first meeting we had with Grazer was, hey, don't build a gorilla of a production. Let's build a spider monkey, light, fast, quick. Let me hire all the guys that knows all the answers and doesn't ask a lot of questions. So that's the people I want to hire. People that I trust and I can depend on. You know, so he gave me that latitude to, to do that and hire those people to create this crack unit. And then um, at the same time, I told him, I said, look, you know, a lot of times we have the actors and we have the doubles. But for me, it's not two people that are trying to make a movie. It's all about the character. Do you believe that's the same person that's doubling the actor or the actress? That's the whole thing about storytelling. So in order to do that, you, you have to create this blend. So I said, give me Kate Bosworth and Michelle Rodriguez for eight weeks if you want to keep them to train. Because uh, the other thing, my background is all in, in um, safety and all in ocean risk management, where I train a lot of the military elite and all the government agencies all about ocean risk management. So um, insurance loves me because of my background. You know, they pick me up and right away I give them my whole, you know, play of where we start. And I color code the ocean from green, yellow, and red. Green being safe, yellow being cautious, red being the most dangerous. And kind of develop this plan of crawl, walk, run, fly. And then we, we get the actresses with us guys, um, you know, right away. Just, it's all about trust and talking. And I tell like Kate's first day, before you can trust us, you gotta trust yourself. And in order to trust yourself, you gotta understand fear. So when we talk about fear, when you guys hear the word fear, what is fear to you guys? Anybody? What is fear? Your interpretation of fear? Nobody? The fear? The unknown? Yeah. Fear. Having your life in danger. Having your life in danger. Anything else? Disappointing others. Disappointing others. So there's all these variables, right? All fear is, basically, is a lack of knowledge. Because if you had every knowledge about the ocean or anything. If I could say that, uh, how much fear you have if I can tell you that you can 100% control your outcome? 100% control your outcome. How much fear would you have? Probably none. None, right? Because it's a abundance of knowledge. So abundance of knowledge, abundance of skill. You know, that's the whole thing. And you have the process in place. So if you have that process in place and stuff too, you, you have this, this whole machine to run forward with no fear because you're dealing from a place of success. That's the whole thing and stuff too. So when people talk about fear, all they're talking about is a lack of knowledge. That's all it is. You guys here to study, to gain that knowledge. So when you go into the film industry, hey, you have no fear because you studied as hard as you could. And I can tell you in the technical world, you know, it's funny, um, I was with two of my other director friends, and I told them, I said, you know, man, I tell you, I think I'll like, go into college and go to film school. And both of them was laughing, and they're going, why are you going to film school? And I go, well, I never learned the basics. And, and they was laughing, goes, you went, I went through so many trials and errors of ups and downs, you know, because one of the things is my greatest success is all my failures, is all my mistakes. I know what not to do, you know, in filmmaking and stuff too. You know, I know who to talk to. I know about weather. I know about, um, you know, when we're going out in the water, like I train um, some of the military guys. And when we're out in the water and stuff too, I'm teaching them about how the ocean speaks to you. And they trying to listen, like, you know, one voice saying something. And I go, it's not about the voice, it's about reading what water's saying. You know, is it dangerous here? Is it safe there? You know, what's 
coming, you know, this, all these things that happen, it doesn't happen and being unpredictable. For me, my world is being predictable, you know. So that's the whole thing. Again, going this back into filmmaking. This is rule number one. Do not have your, uh, you should have your phone on silent, <laughs> on set. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, big time and stuff. A lot of guys get, actually get fired yeah. because of that. You know, oh. you, you interrupt, you know. Um, the rolling sound. The rolling sound. And it's, it's big money that's being spent. So there's a lot of planning that goes along the way in pre-production, <clears throat> before production. You know, and you guys all know about post-production and stuff also too. So both me and Marcus, you know, we also produce, we're also in the DJ, we also direct. So we understand the field. We know a lot, but there's a lot more to learn, even for us. So every day for me, I always humble myself and say, I want to be the greatest student to be a good teacher, you know, because I want to absorb, I can learn something every single day from someone or somebody, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Ball in your court, go ahead. Uh, ball in your guys' court, do you guys, uh, I guess the question as far as um, this program here, what what is entailed with the program? You guys, writers, directors, producers, editors? Yeah, what's your guys' passion? Writing. 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 Why Why is that your passion? I like writing stories, especially about fantasy and sometimes adventure. But mainly drama. I like drama. Good. You know, some, sometimes um, I'll pick up a script and go, oh my god, what am I getting into? But sometimes I pick up a script and I go, oh my god, I'll work for free. <laughs> you know, because it's that good. You know, some, some of these scripts and stuff, you... You re I mean, you don't try to produce it at, get as much as you can, but at the same time, there's some great scripts that really pull and tug on every single emotion, and that's what writing does, and that writing is just one part of the whole process, you know? Then it's putting that writing into visual, into sound, you know, into all that, and then getting the right people, because if you put the wrong person in place, it's like on domino, everything's just gonna fall. You know, so you have to be educated of who you're bringing on, and are they educated in doing the right thing? Um, like Marcus said, it's it's better for you guys, because you know, for us to just throw things at you and hope you kind of catch information and stuff. You guys can guide us, guys. What you want us, or how can we help you? Any questions and stuff? Any cinematographers here? Any passionate um, camera people? Yeah. Well, I, you guys should be a little bit more like this. You know? <laughs> you know, like, if your passion is that, be passionate in the way that you present, like, what you want to be. Because I think that's important. Um, a good example, we've been talking about some, some people that have been coming up to do stunts, and it's like, they're like, yeah, well, uh, what do I need to do now? And we've already told these people what to do, but now... I, it's up to you to, or them, to make that step or make that, that commitment to do it. So same thing with your guys' decision on whichever direction you choose to go in the film world. Because like Brian said, there's so many different avenues, whether maybe you guys like to cook and you guys can be the chef on, on a production, you know, or maybe you're into construction, working with your hands, you can build the sets, or... Uh, you have a thing with fashion, so you can go into wardrobe or makeup or uh, hair, um, visual effects. I mean, things that you guys already know, but there's so many different other things. Maybe you like to find different places where you could film. You can go into locations. You know, so there's a lot of different avenues that you can go. And I think the best thing to do is, I don't know if there's an internship with any of the productions that are out there, that you can intern and get credit for your time that you're spent on on set. But that's a way to kind of like see the whole gamut of everything. Because like Brian said, he's, he didn't go to film school, but every day on set is film school. If you pay attention, you can learn a lot from that. So, um, and my, my example to that is I did go to film school. And did I need it? Not necessarily. Um, but it gave me appreciation for the different departments that are out there. So when you do go to set, you treat them with respect. You know, you understand what 
they're going through just as much as you're going through. So, uh, and that's the thing that I think is important is don't just look at it from your standpoint. Open your perspective up and look at it from all the different um, aspects. And that's what's going to make you a good cinematographer is you're not going to look at it as a two shot from here or a master shot. You're going to maybe throw the camera up overhead or down below or we go tighter on this side and overs and overs. So uh, look at things from a different perspective and I think you'll gain a lot more. Let me show you guys an example and stuff too. One of the, the um, things after I did Waterworld, I had all my stunt friends say, hey Brian, you should move up California. There's more work up there, you know, and then um, you know, go up there and work. And then I went, ah, I don't know, I can always fly up, you know, if they own a job and just work from home. So I worked a lot in California, but I made this home. And then one of the comments I had was one of my friends said, oh, Hollywood can turn you. You you can be like those Hollywood guys, you know, where they just kind of like, you know, you see people just stressed and angry and all that. And I made it my goal to make sure that in Hawaii, we're going to turn Hollywood around and make sure they follow our values, you know, what we have in Hawaii and stuff, our treasure, our, you know, things that we have too. So when they come here, we are on an island. I, I give you one example and stuff too. So when I'm either second unit directing, or stunt coordinating, everybody under me and stuff, all my guys have to go and make sure that when wardrobe comes and they put your things out at the end of the day, don't just throw your wardrobe down. Hey, hang the thing up. Go over there, thank every person, you know. Be appreciative to every single person. When we go to an area and stuff, in there's a community, hey, try to lessen the impact. So we talk to locations and stuff. Let's get permission before we get permits. Because in Hawaii, it's always better to talk story and get permission, then go get the permits. You know, other than that, we're gonna be like super ferry. You know, we're gonna be rail, and then all of a sudden, we're gonna have all this extra costs and stuff too. Same with casting. When casting comes down, we're doing Blue Crush. And the first thing they do is they hire a whole bunch of surfers. What do they do? They all of a sudden put them out at like Haleiwa. And you get more surfers. And now you're managing all these people that don't know the break. You don't know if their abilities and all that. So changing Hollywood's attitude was me going, take away that. How much people you like hire. Bring some key people of what you consider eye candy that you want them visually in front of camera, we can manage them. But if you want 30 extras, let me get them. And I go right to that spot, that local spot. Hey, you guys, who serves over here on a regular basis? Boom, 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 boom. So you're putting back into the community, giving back to the community. So what happens is you gain the respect from that area. Everybody's working together. The place is always happy. I give you one example. Do you guys enjoy what you're doing? Do you have fun? in what you're doing, every single one of you guys. Because if you're not having fun, you're not enjoying, then you're treating this as one job. And being sustainable is having that passion because you gotta have that fire to be sustainable and stuff like that too. The way I feel right now is the same I felt before because both me and Marcus and stuff too, we've driven of who we are, you know? We have, for me, I have one foot in my past because I know where I came from. And my other foot is in the future because I understand all the technicalities of where I'm going, but it creates my balance in my present of where I'm at right now. So that's the whole thing of what, where you move and stuff. So whatever comes at you, you can take them on. And sometimes dealing with the stress and pressure, you have to always remember that you got to reset, find ways that anything you enjoy to kind of just reset your button. Uh, and I, and to, to go on top of that, um, whenever, because I live in LA, but I also have a place in Macaw. So whenever I get frustrated with the business, with LA's traffic, and when I come to Westside's traffic, um, but uh, um, I come back to, like Brian says, to reset, you know, um, to, to become grounded again, to, to remember where you're from. Um, so I came back this time with the intention of producing um, a documentary. So uh, we're doing a documentary right now. We shot half of it here, and the other half is being shot in LA. And um, 
it's my production company. It's the first first uh, project that we uh, were producing, so I take great pride in it. And uh, it's called My Hero's Shadows, and um, it's it's about a sister's perspective on her brother, which is her hero. But to the rest of the world, um, he's he's a monster. And do you guys think you guys would know who this person is? Something to do with figure skating. Oh. Probably before your guys' time, but the Tanya Harding, yeah. Nancy Kerrigan mm -hmm. incident. Well, he's the brother is the guy that actually carried out the act of hitting uh, Nancy Kerrigan. So this is the first time he's ever come out on camera, and it's the first time the sisters actually talked to him about um, this incident and what uh, what she's gone through all these years of not really knowing. So. Um, this was something that a project that had come to me by another friend of mine that's from Kailua, <coughs> which now lives on the mainland, Justin Young, and he has a ma uh, music background. So he went to documentary film school, and I, he showed me some of his his work and very inspirational. You know, it's a different perspective of telling a story, just like each one of you have a story to tell. So don't be afraid to tell your story. You know, and Justin. Um, came to me with this project and came, was it January 2nd, we started shooting. I said, I don't know what we're shooting, but we're going to shoot B-roll. So, I, you know, New Year's Day, I was lining up cameras, equipment, picked up the DP, and next day we're shooting. He's, you know, that night he's making sure he knows the camera and everything, doing his camera test. Next morning, we're at uh, Lanai Lookout shooting Sunrise. And it's just a matter of having the passion to do it. You gotta take that first step. Like Brian said, fear is always gonna be the thing that holds you back. But all fear is, is lack of knowledge. You guys all know how to point that camera and turn that camera on. You guys all have a story to tell. So just do it, you know, the Nike slogan, just do it. So believe in yourself, you know, and go out there and tell your story. Any questions, anybody? Don't you have cool videos to show? <laughs> We're boring them with a bunch, yeah, of, a bunch of YouTube and stuff like that too. You know, every action film that you see, a, a lot of it we've been in, in on most of it and stuff too. Um, Mark has been in um, Avatar, GI Joe, um, all this Mortal Kombat, Matrix, all those kind of things. Um, I've done like Pro Hava, Blue Crush, um, Need for Speed was one of them and stuff too. Um, well, anyway, I, I got more shows than I got surfboards, so I'll that I did. Um, but, you know, one of the greatest things, um, I, I got into directing from stunt coordinating, and then a lot had to do with the directors couldn't go out where I'm at, and I got actors out in one dynamic environment, ever-changing, where we have to safety the director, at the same time safety the actors. So a lot of times the director would say, hey, um, I don't want to go out there, I want to be inside. And there's no monitor to monitor a long line inside of big surfing currents and stuff like that too. So I end up directing all of the scenes and sometimes we get the sound guy out there also too. So um, when that happened, I ended up just fighting for my own DGA card. And then once I got my director's card, that's when it became, uh, for me, more real because I got to control um, the whole unit, which created my success, um, I could deliver. And, and that's the thing too, sometimes you, you um, want stunt coordinator, but you're under the guidance of other people and your success depends on those people. But when you have control over a unit and stuff too, you have a little bit more say of how things come out and more of I can control my outcome. You know, um, i give you one example. Um, I teach everybody on the jet skis around the world. Uh, was the first guy that um, um, developed the whole rescue program. So I teach everyone around the world. So Yamaha wanted me to do a commercial, you know, and uh, out in Hawaii. So they sent this producer down and tried to negotiate with me of, um, you know, doing this and stuff. And <clears throat> right off the bat, try to undercut my rate of what what I work and. 
all of a sudden she started swearing, whoa, 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 stop. You know, this is just being business and not personal. So, you know, let's talk about this. And she kept swearing. I go, wait, you know, it's all about education. So let me educate you. We're talking about this and you need to understand this is how we work. This is my rate. And if you take it to that level where I can put myself under all these stress and swearing, then my rate just doubled. So she swore again. So I go, okay, double, double my rate. So if we keep talking, it's going to triple because you, know, you keep swearing. She keeps going. She swears even more. I go, my rate just tripled. And it's not just my rate, but it's my rate, my equipment, and my men. Everything tripled. So I'll never say no because it's always on price. I'll just price myself up and let them say no. You know, so we went all the way up to five times until she finally just walked away and then called Yamaha up and told them how arrogant I was and all this kind. And I knew the head guy from Yamaha. So he calls me up and he goes, Brian, what's going on? And I just told him the story. I said, hey, look, she came in here and tried to bulldog her way in and just not being professional. And I told him what happened. He goes, oh, my God. So, of course, they got rid of her, brought another producer in. And they came in with double rate for me and my guys and my equipment. And I told him, no, 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 this is my rate. He goes, but we already got the money. I said, it wasn't the principal. She just had to be educated of who we are, how we work, and what we're going to do. Because you allow yourself in, in your world who to be. No one controls that. You know? So you can have negative things around you. You don't have to be there. You know? So that's what the film industry can be. It can be a, a gruesome, hard, negative world, but you can make it your own way too. You know, and that's what's great about Hawaii and stuff too. We live here, and if they don't like it, you know, the way it is, and we're not saying we're arrogant and stuff too, but you're gonna have to pay the price and fly people in. You're gonna have to put per diem. You're gonna have to pay hotels and all that. And all we're asking is just to be fair. That's all it is too fair for what we worth, what our knowledge is, what our skills is, what the respect that we have from the community and people and stuff like that too. And, you know, we have great people in Hawaii that's really knowledgeable and stuff. The sad part is we get torn, we become really good and we get pulled away and, and work far away and stuff also too. Um, one of my projects, you guys seen um, Kelly Slater's uh, Wave, the Wave Machine? Anybody seen that? So I'm also making a wave machine in uh, Spain. It's called Wave Garden. And we're also developing uh, on Surf Park. So we made one in Snowdonia, in Austin, um, doing one in California. And we look in here. One of the things that I'm in charge with is uh, surf culture and safety. But at the same time, because I work in film, we're having the designers and architect designing the things for filming also too. So one of the great things because of what I do and understand filming is we designing the surf so you can film both golden light hours where sunrise, sunset, you have those moments with surf and stuff also too. Um, the infrastructure is all on one side and all the natural environment is on the other side. So when you shoot, you think you're on an outer island. So it's those kind of things and stuff too. Um, the infrastructure is far away so the shadows doesn't fall in. So all these designs is input inside of this thing also to it, and even the design of the lighting. So it's great being part of a bigger project because it's probably gonna be the first uh, water surfing studio that we're gonna develop and stuff also too. So I try to bring them over here in Hawaii and making the first um, Olympic training facility for surfing because now surfing is gonna be in the Olympics and stuff also too. So that's one of the great projects and stuff. I took Marcus with me and we went up Europe and, you know, he ended up traveling all over and stuff, but it's an amazing machine. Yeah. Oh, that's Kelly's one, yeah. yeah. Kelly's machine Where stuff. Where would you put that? Huh? Where would you make it? In mm. his backyard, if yeah. you could. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, have, it would be, yeah, you'd have to, like, it'd be basically. It, it's a pool. So the <laughs> one in uh, Snowdonia and Austin, it's uh, pretty big and long but the new technology they, they just made and stuff also too it's a smaller imprint in fact um my friend he um lives in 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 france and he's a well-off um guy kind of like uh, hervé chapelier he makes all these high designer bags and stuff too but basically 
he has enough money where he put putting one in his backyard, you know, and it's it's a lot of money. Yeah. But yeah, when that happens and stuff like that too, we're gonna be employing a lot of, you know, local people and stuff, and we're gonna have a lot of filmmaking. Um, some of the things that we're designing in that is uh, our own production studio. Me and Marcus was talking about, you know, in California they have a training facility for stunts, a warehouse where the guys can go there and practice. We don't have that in Hawaii over here. We train pretty much out in the environment or at our homes or houses or at gyms and when we're around and stuff also too. But we also want to try to groom up and coming people and stuff. But we're talking about where that facility might exist that we can train more people and stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that's Kelly's Wave. So this is man made machine and all this and stuff too. So the heavy part is, you know, man has just now created what nature gives, you know, and it's just amazing and stuff. So the great thing about it is there's no sharks. <laughs> There's no reef. Um, we can train actors and actresses. One of the goals I wanted to take is non-surfers and go over there and train them and turn them into high caliber surfers and then compete them, you know, in the ocean and stuff. And I wanted to take people from inland kind of, you know, and then show people of what this facility can do. What you can see in surfing is that the pro surfers, if they don't have access to these machines, they can get bypassed. Because um, you, can, you guys all know Kelly Slater, right? You guys know about John John. So remember this name, Kai, from Spain and France. So his father owns this machine, and he surfs every single day. He catches a thousand waves more than any other person and stuff. So he's developing all his skills all the time and stuff, too. So you see that, how shallow it is, too? And another <coughs> important thing is what you're watching it took a team to do that right yeah so if the surf park or when the surf park comes here they're going to need as much media as possible to to get out to the masses who can tell me what's this on is this on sticks what lens is this fish eye is this on a normal lens it's a really long lens yeah yeah oh yeah you know, we always play games of what size lens is that. And then, um, you know, a lot of people, they don't understand, you know, you film your wides and your tights, but some of the most important things is your transitions, especially when you're filming water and oceans. So when you look at a lot of the things in a, um, water movies, whether Pro Hava or Blue Crush or, you know, whatever it is and stuff too, watch for the transitions because a lot of times you'll see the way it get washed over. So, you know, the camera goes underwater. So the next one is, it'll be a cut from another day where the camera comes out of the water, white water. Or they'll flare into the sun at the end of the shot. And then the next shot, they'll begin with a flare of the sun. You know, or they'll do a swipe of a person walks by or surf what goes by. So it's all of those transitions that's really important if you, uh, you know, because the editor's looking for these pieces. You know, as a filmmaker and cameraman, just understand that, you know, where your camera starts off and where it ends, you know. So there's a small story within the story. Okay. Um, as far as footage-wise to view, can is rated R stuff not? No. You know what? Because well, it was about transitions, and this it's one of the one of the scenes that I directed, but it's kind of violent, at least going through the. Which one? The banshee fight through the car. Yeah. Oh, that one. That's yeah. Not too bad. I mean, violent. Are you guys okay with violence? I don't know. Yeah, it's on YouTube. I've yeah. seen. So I've seen that one. Fight. Sure. We all like adults. The food. Yeah. V N S H E D. Some people fights. don't like first friends. Yeah. They're just trying to be. So go to. Solo. Me, I don't know. <coughs> Maybe you can make me fast forward a little because it's all dialogue. Unless you guys want to watch the dialogue. Oh, is that Yes. Yay, next. So Marcus coordinated and directed this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good <laughs> scene. <laughs> Hi there. 
So you're Proctor's big bad watchdog. You don't look so tough from where I'm standing. So here's the plan. First, I'm gonna kill you. Then I'm going inside, and I'm gonna slowly gut your boss and his little house on the prairie niece. I don't think so. we get the script and then they go figure it out at that point because this is now season three and I started on um, season one and they would turn over the action to us so we'd have to take into consideration one what the writers want one what the director wants one what the showrunner wants one what the actors want you know so there's a lot of massaging that happens so this se sequence took us probably about a month to plan out and execute um, just to kind of let you guys know, um, how long do you think it took to shoot this? Probably just a, five week? to seven days. Five to seven days. Maybe two weeks. No. Two weeks. Anyone else? Like just shooting. Just shooting the the sequence. Yeah. I mean the sequence keeps going, <laughs> but it gets gross. So that's why I stopped. Aww. So you guys want to see it? You guys got to YouTube it or or. By the DVD. Yeah. <laughs> um, see more. All, all that is like on dance, right? Choreography and stuff. How long do you think just mm. prepping <coughs> before you're shooting just to do that? How long do you think the days they need? It must a take a long a time because they got to practice. At least a month. <laughs> so this is a kind of unique um, situation with this. So we had an actor on the East Coast. This is in uh, North Carolina. So he was with us. He sprained his ankle. Mm -hmm. So they moved this, this fight from one episode to the next episode. Mm -hmm. This actress wasn't on contract with us, so she was, on, or she was under contract but not there. So she was on the West Coast. So I had to shoot the fight, send it to stunt guys over there that I trust to teach her, her side of the fight. Mm -hmm. We're teaching him his side of the fight from the East Coast. We had one week to bring them both together to rehearse together, and then we shot that in one day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, just to let you know about preparation, and Brian's been talking a lot about prep, it's crucial that we have the right amount of prep. If you don't prep, and something falls out in prep, it'll never run smooth. We, wouldn't, we should not have been able to do that in one day. There's some visual effect shots that we had as well. There's another acting scene 
with the guy with the glasses before this that we got all in one day. Um, but we had a day of rehearsal with the camera guy, with the actors and the doubles, and we made the camera guy go in and out of the car. We hand, you know, won't give all the secrets away. Yeah. But, um, you know, that camera's constantly moving, and because of that prep, we were able to pull it off in the one day. You, you know, you guys probably, somebody in here will be future directors, future producers and stuff too. And um, listen to the foundation of a lot of what Mark is saying and stuff too, because a lot of times we end up trying to fight for the prep. And what happens is it ends up falling short of what they want because they never give us that prep time. Or worse yet, somebody gets hurt. Yeah, exactly. And, and that happens, can happen a lot. You know, stunt guys don't go on set to get hurt. They're the best guys because they don't get hurt. They're probably some of the safest people, girls and guys, on set. They understand exactly what's going on. What you see right there, also too, there's people on the side flanking them, you know, for safety-wise. Whether they catch them with on mat, you know, kind of thing, or, you know, um, coming in and, and putting, you know, whether it's a an armadillo, you know, on the back or the front or sides and just dressing them up. But you always want to make sure that, you know, before you do a stunt, just say, am I uh, managing all my risks? You know, at what level is, is this risk and stuff too? You know, because the safety guy can come out and, and you're going to save it. You know, hey, this is what happened. Everybody heard about the, um, what was that, the girl got ran over by the train and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You guys never hear that? Oh, the Sorry. girl who got hit by the by train. The train. That, yeah. that movie? Yeah. And one of them is because the director is the pushing. Yeah. You know, just pushing, pushing, pushing. I want, I want, I want, I want. And he's not only the one wrong, the people who are wrong is the one who follow too. So, you know, if you feel that something's wrong, speak up, move out, you know? Wait, so um, I'm so lost on what happened. Uh, what happened? Okay. So there was a movie being filmed, okay, in the mainland and stuff too, right? Um, so, <coughs> forgot her last name, Sarah. Yeah, is she, what, she was a camera assistant, um, PA. She was a camera. Yeah, camera. I think she was a camera assistant. Yeah. Assistant, right? Yeah. So anyway, in the film industry, it was big news because um, they went out on the train tracks, and you only have this much space to stand on. That's it. Okay. And the locations person said, oh, okay, we got it, it's all right, or whatever, and stuff too. And the director kind of said, we, we just go. Not checking that the train's actually running, oh. you know? So all of a sudden, they deal, you know, because that's why you permit, and they make sure that, hey, it's locked off. You know, there's no trains, there's no cars, it's locked off. It's all safe. All of a sudden, this train came, nowhere to run, and boom, she died, you know? Mm. So that's what happens on set. But anyway, we, we telling you guys the realism of what can happen when things get rushed. You know, people get emotional. People get so kind of like lasered into their job, they kind of forget to open their visions up to everything. Because everybody here is important of what you're doing in the process of this production. And you have to think that way. There's no, no one under you. I look at everybody as we're all like this, and we're working together. I'm not stepping on anybody below me and stuff too. You know, there's decision makers above me and stuff that get, giving me information, but it's my job to make sure that, that information funnels down right, and we're all moving together and stuff too, okay? Any questions of anything and stuff? I mean, the other one, you guys um, like? How long does a season take exactly to film? Of this. Uh, did that depends. Like uh, the first three seasons was ten episodes, and the last season, <coughs> I guess the uh, you gotta tell them how long because y your series was longer than half an hour. Oh, so this is an hour an hour, hour series, program. Yes. So ten episodes, ten hours. That's like shooting five features back yeah, to yeah. back, um, and the action was like shooting features. So. Um, from prep to, to to end was probably I want to say five five months. She probably around five to six months was the time that we shot the, the whole series. Um, the second or the fourth season was eight episodes, so we were probably around five, something like that. 
Mm-hmm. I think it was like nine day episodes, and then mm-hmm. when money got tight, they bottlenecked and made an episode mm-hmm. smaller, and that went down to like seven days, so they shaved two days off of shooting. So you filmed three seasons ahead, or two seasons ahead? No, we shoot one season, they release the season, and depending on viewership, then oh. they would they okay. would say whether it's going to go a second season. And then, you know, slowly got some fame to it, and then went third season, and they finished on fourth. Are these series on a network, or are they... It's a Cinemax series. Oh, Cinemax series, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's nothing about being inspiring and, <laughs> and inspiring other people. It's it's a it's a entertaining show, um, ultra violent. So um, I remember saying when I went in for the our phone interview, I said some people say that I can be sick and twisted. Do you want me to go there? And the producer said, absolutely. So the first fight was the the thing that set the tempo where they're like, just do what he says. You know, because they had no idea about how to how to create the the action that we were giving them. So they're go ahead, you know, write it. The writers just talk to stunts, and we would create that. And I think something um, to understand about stunts and the different um, I wouldn't even say hierarchy because it's not a hierarchy, but you have a stunt coordinator, which is the boss. If a show is fight intensive, you could have a fight coordinator, which then puts the action together, trains your actors and whatnot, um, choreographs the fights, and then you have your stunt performers that would do the stunts. There's stunt rigging, where if you're flying people from one end of the room to the other end of the room, um, would be the ones in charge of safety of that. Uh, But overall, like we had uh, spoken on the way here, the stunt coordinator is, has the ultimate responsibility. If somebody gets hurt, it's on that person. Somebody dies on your on your watch, that's on your shoulders. So, it's a very um, complex um, job to have because there's a lot of responsibilities on on your shoulders. And, and one of the things we've talked about this is you you hear a lot about being responsible. The only way you can be responsible is really being accountable. So you have to be accountable for your actions, and if, if you're in charge, you're accountable for all the people with you too. So you have to own that. You, you can't all of a sudden, you know, tradition nowadays is like point fingers. That's not being responsible. You know, having trust in each other, being accountable for each other. And that's why you develop all these relationships and all these trainings. And when we train and stuff like, like I can say 100%, when I bring Marcus on, I can be responsible for him because I'm accountable for him and you know vice versa you know we in each other's heads we know all of our strengths with each other and stuff too you know, that we combine um, we also did uh, I did um, point break two if you guys seen giant waves and all kind of different stunts so what they did with point break two it was a stunt show kind of feature and they hired like the best bike riders and the best uh, wingsuit guys and stuff too and then I was tasked with all the surfing stuff so all the surfing you seen with giant waves was at Jaws and the waves was 70 feet and that Chopo and the waves was like you know 50 feet and thick and only two feet deep so you know our stunt guys that we had I had seven stunt guys for two actors you know because we rotate them out and stuff too and um, huge risks and then a safety team behind that um, what sometimes um, you don't see, they flanked um, the surfers. But in writing, we make sure that the writing, we write the safety within the, the, the film. So you see the jet skis there. So when something happened, they can respond from inside that you know realm of safety and stuff too. Like, play something. You ever surf anything like this? So I get the whole production right in like the pit of the oh, shit.
the thing is when you know those areas and stuff too and that's why everybody who's out there is handpicked the drivers you know the safety guys you know we fly the guys most of them come from here the other guys I train so all the surfing contests that you see around the world so I go there and train every single person so then that way when I get there and stuff you know they know CPR they know spinal extrications they know what to do and, and then even um, Tahiti when they got the contest I developed the whole safety structure, so everything in time management of um, <clears throat> we time land, sea, and air of, of e entries and exits and response, uh, makeshift hospitals. When we um, uh, in the hospitals, we hire trauma doctors and make sure they're from you know U.S. So there's no you know language barriers and stuff like that too. So it's a whole team of people when we're doing this kind of things. I bring my own mechanic that I write into my contract. So again, you know, I work from a place of success because I build my people with me and stuff too. And that's the difference and stuff too, you know, when you work, it's always stronger when you work as one group, as one team, you know. And that's the reason why productions keep coming back to us guys, because we deliver what we say. Any questions, anybody? Um, point Break, like the movie with Keanu Reeves. Mm -hmm. So, where was the last wave filmed? Why, yeah. The one that uh, From. Pat Swayze went over the falls? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, that was at Waimea, and that was Derek Donor that was doubling uh, Patrick and stuff also, too. So, we have to teach Patrick and Keanu how to surf. And Keanu, when he was here, his biggest movie back then was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So, he wasn't that yeah, he well known wasn't. actor. Patrick was because he did, you know, ghosts and stuff, too. And both of them became, you know, close friends when we was there and stuff also too. And what was um, weird and funny is when we were at Pipeline, um, the guys rigged um, the speed rail floating inside a pipeline when it was kind of flat and the waves coming up. And I was looking at them going, why are you guys rigging this? I said, oh, so we can hold the actors in place so we can pull focus. And I'm going, pull focus at Pipeline and, you know, that. You know, one thing you don't battle is mother nature you know so anyway i told him like they can get hurt you know 
and then you know my, my other friend going hurt they might die you know so as soon as you know the safety guys start talking like that everybody start going whoa so patrick runs up he goes i ain't going in i i, I wouldn't patrick you know so then a panic came up about you know where everybody's running to us why are you telling the guys that they're in danger because they're in danger you know we're not going to stand here and, and just let you guys shish kebab these guys and do you know what it is so again you know having one voice and being confident sometimes it's like if people gonna fire you for doing the right thing, let them fire you. Because be comfortable with who you are and that you contend with doing the right thing. You know? Don't let people force you to do the wrong things. You know, and then when something happens, you only have yourself to blame. That's where the name of this production company, Controlled Chaos, came from, because we were talking and that's what we do on set, you know, as stunt coordinators, we control the chaos. Mm -hmm. We you know we manage different departments as far as making sure that everyone has the right information and it can be chaotic at times but it's up to us to do our due diligence to make sure that the safety of not only our crew but the rest of the film crew is is um, first and foremost yeah. any other questions What's like your most insane stunt that you either coordinated or did yourself? No, you know, it's funny because we get this ass all the time, huh? And, um, you know, it's not really crazy, right? Because we've done a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, I was on Rundown and with The Rock, and I was one of the guys inside of the pipe buggies. And um, we were up in the mountains and stuff like that, too. And... Uh, I put mine in reverse and there's a thousand foot cliff on this side, thousand foot cliff on this side and I'm just reversing and my um, pan that has my brake, gas and clutch on it uh, had three kind of just spot weld on the bottom of the plate broke off and it twisted which pulled the throttle into full just open my throttle wide open and I was in reverse. So I'm going full on backwards looking at the thousand foot cliff on this side and I'm in a five point you know harness inside so I there's no way of getting out so all I'm doing is just driving back trying to keep calm and looking to bang into something and I saw the Unimog truck with the big tires and just aim straight for that and just slam into the tires and turn my key off and stuff too but if I panic and went right or left I'd be gone so, you know, that's the kind of mishaps that can happen, you know, unforeseen. And then, you know, you trust um, people on set to make sure you check things. But again, um, it's up to you to make sure you double check all these things and stuff also too. So, you know, just from experience, you, you learn that and go through more of those kind of things. But I think um, everything that we've done, um, I'll give you an example too. We just talked about this yesterday. Um, I was on loss and... I, one of the actors had to steal a canoe, and he couldn't steer the canoe, and uh, I had to go on the water and put on the suction cups and stay on the water and, and actually steer the canoe as they paddle. But we've been having shark sightings lately, you know? So then uh, every time we see one shark, we would tell the, our stunt guys, safety guys, hey, jellyfish. So as soon as they say jellyfish, we tell the director and everybody, hey, jellyfish, get up. So the actors, they wouldn't panic because you want them in the right frame of mind. You don't want them freaking out thinking, what, shark, 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 because we can't act, right? Yeah, so then, you know, jellyfish, go, jellyfish, what? Oh, I don't like it stinging, put it in the water. So we just move away, you know? But that's the whole thing is we just want to be productive. We want to be successful. And the shark's going to stay there. We're just going to move to where it's not. Real easy, real simple. Don't make a big thing out of it, okay? So anyway. That was the code until Josh all of a sudden going, hey, you guys, you guys seen jellyfish, but it, you guys seen shark. So they caught on, and the actors started talking among themselves. So then I go, you know what, we got to change the code. So, so they go, Brian, what's the code? So I go, the code is have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. So then I'm on the water now, and so I'm steering this thing. And then here comes the boat with the camera, the director, and the marine guys. And it come right up underwater because here's the camera on this side and, and I'm on the water and I'm swinging up to take a breath off camera and then back down and then back up and back down like this. So when I come up, one of the guys yelling, Brian, Brian, 
what? Have a nice day. Yeah, yeah, so what? Keep going on the... And then I come back up. Brian, Brian, have a nice day. S keep filming. Why, you know, why are you bothering me? Go back down. Come back up. Brian, Brian, jellyfish. Oh. <laughs> I forgot my own code. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that was a funny part about all that and stuff too. But, you know, even like sharks, you know, I, I get this girl. I don't know if you guys know Ocean Ramsey. She swims with great whites. She mm. swims with tiger sharks. And I um, swam with, with sharks, and I understand um, how sharks, um, you know, react. Because one of the biggest things is if you act like prey, then they're going to treat you like prey. But if you act like a predator, then they'll stand off. A lot of it is they can read the bioelectric of your heart, you know, so when you panic, and the thing went like this, you're acting like prey. But if you're calm and just breathing slow, you're acting like predator. They can read all that kind of stuff. So it's funny throughout the years that we've kind of programmed ourselves like, wow, you know, it's really our fear that takes advantage and turns us into prey instead of predator and stuff. So a lot of times, as long as the water's clear, our guys is fine underwater. You know, we can deal with it and stuff and we see them. I, I was on water road and I'm on the underwater jet ski like this and I got my safety guys behind and all the stunt guys on the side of this and this big 15 foot tiger shark swims right in front of us guys and I'm underwater with the aqualung tank looking at this shark like this and he swims by and I look down and nobody's on the other skis and I look down this way and nobody's on the other skis and I look behind everybody behind me <laughs> and they all like this looking at the shark, shark swims down so we all surface, we come off, and everybody's talking, and, and I go, guys, guys, don't panic, it's clear the water. So we all come up, I go to the director, and I go, hey, David, you know, we have a shark over here, it's fine, just a couple guys, just kind of watch. So the, the other guys kind of panic, and they brought power heads or bank sticks, so basically, it's a gun on the water with a, with a shell. So I got 50 guys all loaded, and they're all afraid, <laughs> and they're like this. So I'm on the, the thing, and this guy's bumping up against me with this loaded thing. And then I go, what is this? So I grab the thing from him. And then I call for the guy for call the, the sound for everybody's surface. Because we can talk underwater. We have a sound system with the visual where the director can talk to all of us underwater. So get everybody up, grab them, have another safety meeting. Tell the director, hey, there's two things dangerous. There's a shark and the guys behind this bank stick, and I'm more afraid of these guys behind the bank stick. <laughs> so get them all up, give me two guys, and just watch. So, you know, things happen. So when you talk about things that happen dangerous, there's always dangerous things. It's always about managing risks and setting up the right process so you can mitigate those kind of risks. You know? A lot of dangerous things that happen aren't seen. Yeah. Or it's stopped because of you know, extra set of eyes that said, this doesn't look right. And it's not necessarily my set of eyes or Brian's set of eyes. It's that, like he says, you surround yourself with the right team, then you listen to the team because you obviously are the person that hired these people. And if they see something wrong, then they, they, they interject and say, hey, maybe we should rethink this. The, or, or the other part too, people are afraid to run into frame or to yell and yell cut because they feel like it's not their place. But for us guys, we know the balance between, you know, getting a shot and being safe. So we have no problem yelling cut or just running into frame and then protecting whether the actor or the stunt person is stuck to them. Okay. So I think this is a perfect time to break. It's almost 12.20. The class ends at 12.20. So if there's uh, not any last question, I'd like to thank both Brian and Marcus for taking your time. Mm -hmm. I would really appreciate it. Did you uh, ever work with a man named Achilles Gassis? Oh yeah, I know Achilles well. Oh yeah, he was my professor for my intro to cinema class. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I met him when I first got here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Achilles, I've done a bunch of different um, Hawaii Five-O and Lost and all kind of different stuff with Achilles. Oh, yeah. uh, also, do you know anywhere um, where they hold auditions for uh, TV shows that are filmed here? Yeah, so Rachel Sutton is like the main casting director. So she does pretty much all of them, you know, so, and she can be contacted at the studios, you know, you can go down to Hawaii Five-O and ask for Rachel and just put your name inside of the, the casting and stuff too. 
Is there anything that I might need for uh, in order to get in? Um, depends, right? I mean, what you're going for, because there's a lot of extra work. Uh, one of the things is being SAG or Screen Actors Guild. It's either having a principal role or you can get in SAG, but you can ask her and stuff also too. Um, a lot of the guys in stunts, most of them are like athletes that double certain people. You know, like Marcus just uh, doubled um, Danny Kim, Daniel Day Kim on 5-0 yeah. and stuff also too. So he was doing a driving stunt just this past week. Okay. Anyway, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Inspired. Inspired.